There's dumb, and then there's dumb. You've all probably heard of the Darwin Award-style stupidity of people launching themselves off cliffs with homemade rocket cars, but there have been some incredibly dumb leaders and influential figures throughout history. Folks who have led armies into doomed battles, been dragged through forests by deer, and kicked the bucket on the toilet. And a lot of these dummies have some less than savory backstories. Here are creepy things you didn't know about the dumbest people in history. Basil's Wild Ride It takes a certain kind of stupidity to somehow get your belt caught in the antlers of a deer while out hunting and then get dragged 16 miles through the forest. But it also takes a scary kind of cutthroatedness. Is that a word? Savagery. Whatever. It takes a pretty mean person to off his own mentor and basically steal the throne of an empire for himself. Basil I, also known as Basil the Macedonian, ruled the Byzantine Empire from 1867 to 886 AD. He's been generally regarded by historians as a capable ruler who implemented some important reforms and stabilized the Byzantine Empire. But he was a pretty ruthless guy, and the way he died could have made it into the Darwin Awards. Basil initially served as a trusted advisor and friend to Michael III, who was the Byzantine Emperor at the time. Michael III was no saint himself. There are accounts that he was a bit of a drunk. I mean, his nickname was Michael the Drunkard, so there's probably a good bit of truth to that. But despite his love of the sauce, Michael was apparently a pretty good mentor to Basil, who came from a poor background and rose to become one of the most powerful guys in Byzantium. Basil was an Armenian who moved from a small village in Thrace to Constantinople, where he began making a name for himself as a wrestler and horseman. His chariot skills eventually caught the eye of Michael, and the emperor eventually made Basil the guardian of the imperial bedroom. Now that's a funny sounding title that was actually quite important. From there, Basil went about persecuting anyone he saw as a threat to the emperor. He did such a good job that Michael eventually made him co-ruler of the empire. Pretty crazy and unprecedented move. At his coronation, Michael stated that it is my will that Basil, who is loyal to me and definitely won't have me punctured to death in 16 months, should be the guardian and manager of my empire and should be proclaimed by all as Basilius. Unfortunately for Michael, Basil wasn't happy with the co part of the deal and had Michael meet his maker a year and a half later while he was sleeping in his bed. You can almost taste the irony of Basil's initial guardian of the imperial bedroom title. But Basil's bad karma would come back to haunt him and drag him through a forest on the antlers of a deer. Check this out. One day, while out on a hunt, and I don't know how this is possible, but apparently it happened, Basil's belt got caught in the antlers of a deer. Maybe he shot the poor animal, and thinking it was dead, the emperor sauntered up to it to admire his work. But before he knew it, the deer was up, antlers up, its antlers snagged in Basil's trousers, and it pranced off through the woods, dragging Basil along for the ride for 16 miles. He was eventually freed by an attendant who cut him loose with a knife. But Basil, always suspicious, thought the attendant may have had ulterior motives, and Basil had him killed shortly before the emperor succumbed to his own injuries and died in August of 886. The King Who Spawned Tabloids Tabloids are everywhere these days. Gossip about celebrities is all the rage. Who's seen who? Why this relationship is falling apart? What scandalous thing did this person do? 20 reasons why you should drop everything and focus on why Gwyneth Paltrow named her daughter Apple. It just never ends. The whole tabloid industry got started in early 19th century England with a king so dumb that people simply couldn't look away. Let's just say King George IV wasn't frugal. His reign was characterized by extravagant indulgence and excessive spending on all kinds of personal luxuries, art, and architecture. He commissioned the Royal Pavilion in Brighton as basically his pleasure palace, known for its unique Indo-Saracenic architectural style typical of Britain's Indian colonialism. His lavish lifestyle and expensive taste earned him a less than savory reputation. One of the most infamous scandals during his reign was his trouble and highly publicized marriage to Carolina Brunswick. The couple's relationship was pretty contentious from the start. They were married in 1795, but George IV was apparently repulsed by Caroline and refused to live with her. They lived separate lives and their relationship quickly deteriorated. In 1820, when George IV ascended to the throne a few years after his father had been declared insane, he tried to divorce Caroline on the grounds that she committed adultery. 
He basically says something along the lines of, You bimbo, you have had a legitimate child and doth be sleeping around throughout England. But the whole thing kind of backfired on the king, and his attempt to divorce Caroline turned into a public spectacle. Caroline was quite popular with the people, and her trials became widely followed by the public. In the end, the divorce proceedings failed because of the lack of evidence and the sympathy the public had for Caroline. The scandal surrounding the failed attempt to divorce Caroline severely damaged George IV's public image. He became increasingly isolated from the people and faced widespread criticism and ridicule. His reputation as a hedonistic and extravagant ruler, coupled with his failed personal life, didn't do much to help the monarchy standing. And then came the tabloids. Advancements in printing tech and growing literacy rates led to the proliferation of newspapers catering to a wider audience. The newspapers of the time were often politically aligned and focused on reporting serious news and political discussions. But George and his escapades were like a bad movie you couldn't look away from, and the press quickly realized the commercial potential of catering to people who couldn't look away from bad movies. A new kind of journalism popped up. Newspapers started featuring sensational stories about the royals, including the king's relationships, his lavish lifestyle, and his controversies. These stories often had a gossipy and scandalous tone, appealing to readers' curiosity and desire for titillating information. Publishers recognized the commercial value of these stories, and newspapers began to compete with each other for readership by focusing on sensationalism, personal scandals, and celebrity gossip. This shift in approach led to a change in the tone and content of reporting, which laid the foundations for the development of the modern tabloid industry. Thanks a lot, George. Cannonball! You ever wanted to impress your significant other? What did you do? Buy some flowers? Take them out for a nice dinner? Maybe go on a trip somewhere exotic? Well, back in 15th century Scotland, one king wanted to impress his missus so badly that he ended up dying because of it. During his reign in the 15th century, James II was known for his passion for artillery and military tech. But things went a little too far. An unfortunate incident unfolded involving a cannonball and the king's legs. Now, according to the story, James II organized a demonstration of artillery capabilities as entertainment for his wife, Queen Mary. The event was meant to showcase the power and precision of cannons, highlighting their importance in warfare. Sexy, huh? During the demonstration, the king apparently stood too close to the cannons, disregarding safety precautions. Uh-oh. He was the king, after all, and no lowly engineer or whoever was in charge of safety would ruin his day. Tragically, one of the cannons misfired or malfunctioned. The cannonball, instead of firing straight ahead, reportedly veered off course and struck the king, severing or severely injuring his legs. The injuries were so bad James II succumbed to them shortly after the incident. Now, I'm not sure how impressed Queen Mary was with that. Lord Cardigan's Cardigan First up, we have a guy who had a piece of clothing named after him. But despite people who think the cardigan may look dumb, Lord Cardigan's decisions during the Crimean War were even dumber. Lord Cardigan, whose full name was James Thomas Brudenell, was a British military officer who was most notorious for his role in ordering the ill-fated charge of the Light Brigade during the Crimean War. The charge took place on October 25, 1854, during the Battle of Balaclava, and it didn't go well. I mean, we'll get into the guy's fashion sense off the battlefield and his promiscuities later, but first, war. It all started when Lord Cardigan, as the commander of the British cavalry, received ambiguous orders to attack Russian artillery positions. The British commander in the Crimean War, Lord Raglan, sent an order to Cardigan through a messenger. The order was to attack and prevent the Russians from removing captured British guns from a position known as the Causeway Heights. But like in a game of telephone played by kids who speak different languages, some words were left out or misunderstood, and the orders were missing some pretty crucial details. The order from Lord Raglan to Lord Cardigan went like this. Lord Raglan wishes the cavalry to advance rapidly to the front, follow the enemy, and try to prevent the enemy carrying away the guns. Troop horse artillery may accompany. French cavalry is on your left. So Lord Raglan basically wanted Lord Cardigan to launch an assault, despite his lack of commas and his vague sense of direction. Happy the French cavalry was on the left. But we might have a classic case of do shoot the messenger here. The guy tasked with delivering the order accidentally delivered a note that lacked the crucial phrase to the front, which clarified the intended direction of the charge. Without this pretty important piece of information, Lord Cardigan interpreted the order literally and understood it as a command to charge directly at the Russian artillery stationed at the end of the valley in front of them. The charge itself was a disaster. 
the Light Brigade had little chance of success against overwhelming Russian forces. The soldiers rode valiantly, but the attack resulted in heavy casualties. Out of around 670 men who participated in the charge, more than 270 were killed, wounded, or captured. The charge achieved very little in terms of its military objectives and was widely criticized as a futile and poorly planned action. But just look at Cardigan, leading the charge on his horse Ronald, clueless about the fate that awaits his brigade. And just look at Cardigan's Cardigan, flapping in the breeze, a majestic 1800s fashion statement that will live on long after the English Lord. Well, all right, not entirely true. Cardigan didn't really wear his cardigan into battle, but his horse was named Ronald, and they both led and actually survived the ill-fated charge. But beyond his inept military decision-making, Lord Cardigan was also known for his eccentric fashion sense. He was often seen wearing extravagant and flamboyant outfits, which included brightly colored uniforms complete with accessorized hats. And of course, there were his famous knitted waistcoats. And beyond his fashion exploits, Lord Cardigan had an interesting personal life. He owned a yacht that he named the Lena, stationed in Balaclava during the Crimean War. Lord Cardigan oftentimes went ashore to seek the company of local women. I'm pretty sure they were turned on by his extravagant cardigans and his boat. Just picture Cardigan in nothing but swim trunks and a cardigan, wooing women on his yacht with stories about how he led one of the stupidest charges in history. The Drunk Pope when you think of Pope, you probably think pious guy, white robes, fancy Pope mobile, eloquent addresses from the Vatican, you know, stuff like that. But this wasn't the case for Pope John XII. He took thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife to a whole new level. In 955 AD, Pope John XII ascended to CEO of Catholicism at the remarkably young age of 18. At the start of his papacy, John XII faced a lot of skepticism, both because of his young age and the fact that his election was probably influenced by his father, Alberic II, a Roman nobleman who kind of considered himself a self-stylized Prince of Rome and had some pretty grand ambitions for his son. During his tenure, John XII developed a reputation for, let's say, indulgence. He would throw some pretty wild parties, drink in excess, have all kinds of affairs, and generally just engage in pretty unpope like behavior. John's frat boy version of Catholicism drew criticism from both within and outside the church. One of the significant events during his papacy was the strained relationship with Otto I, who would later become Emperor of Germany. John XII initially supported Otto's rival, Berenger II, which was kind of a dumb move. John and Berenger conspired against Otto to have him ousted. Now, in response, Otto marched on Rome, captured the city, and convened a council in 963 that effectively deposed John XII from the papacy. Although he was technically still the Pope, he really didn't care. John was off hunting in the mountains when Otto officially had him booted. Hopefully, the trip went a bit better than Basil's. So John was basically free to keep partying and enjoying the company of women. But his lifestyle would soon catch up to him. According to the account of Luprand of Cremona, a medieval scholar, Pope John XII met a pretty drastic end while engaged in an adulterous encounter outside of Rome. Lutprand, known for his colorful and sometimes sensationalist descriptions, suggests that John XII's demise was either the result of apoplexy, aka a stroke, or at the hands of an outraged husband. According to Lutprand, Pope John XII was allegedly engaging in an illicit affair when he suffered a sudden stroke. This sudden health crisis could have been caused by things like high blood pressure or a ruptured blood vessel in the brain. Lutprand's account implies that an intimate encounter was intense enough to trigger a fatal brain pop a life of excess, a death of excess. Lutpran also gives the possibility that John met a violent end at the hands of a vengeful husband. This version of events suggests that the Pope's adulterous actions provoked the wrath of a betrayed spouse, who got revenge for the infidelity. Apparently, John didn't read the Bible very closely. Caligula's Absurdity Caligula was a Roman emperor with a lot going on, and not in a good way from getting far too close with his family members, to appointing his horse to a high-ranking government position, to parading around with a seashell costume claiming he was the king of the ocean, here are the greatest hits of this monumental, imbecilic emperor who reigned from 37 to 41 AD. Caligula was said to have had intimate relationships with all three of his sisters, Julia Lavilla, Agrippina the Younger, and Drusilla. He was especially close with Drusilla, who was his favorite sister, and he was apparently very close with her from a very young age. Caligula was so obsessed with Drusilla that he had her deified after her death and built a temple in her honor.
Caligula didn't just keep it in the family, though. He spread his love around with other women, both married and unmarried, and with other men. He became particularly fond of taking the wives of other senators and powerful men, a move that would in part lead to his assassination just four years after he became emperor. Some say Caligula even liked to dress up in women's clothing and get friendly with his male courtiers. From cruel to unusual, let's move to downright crazy. One of the most bizarre stories about Caligula is that he wanted to make his horse, in Catatus, a council. Caligula was apparently really fond of his little horse buddy and treated it like royalty. He reportedly gave Incatatus a marble stable with an ivory manger, a jeweled collar, and even a housekeeper to look after him. The story goes that Caligula became so impressed with his horse's abilities that he considered appointing him as a consul, which was one of the highest positions in the Roman Republic. A consul was a top government official who shared power with the Roman Senate, and the idea of a horse holding such a position was obviously absurd. It's not certain how serious Caligula was about making Incatatus a consul or whether he was just pulling some weird Roman prank. But either way, it's become one of the most well-known examples of Caligula's alleged madness and eccentricity. But wait, there's more. In 39 AD, Caligula decided to lead a campaign to conquer Germanic tribes in the Rhine region. The campaign was a failure, though, and Caligula's soldiers refused to cross the river, causing Caligula to retreat back to Rome in disgrace. To compensate for his military failure, Caligula decided to stage a triumphal procession anyway, pretending that he'd been a great victorious leader. He ordered his troops to gather seashells from the English Channel, which he claimed were spoils of a great naval victory over the people of Britannia. He also ordered his soldiers to collect war booty, like helmets and armor, even though they had never even engaged in any battles. Caligula then paraded through the streets of Rome wearing a breastplate covered in seashells and declared himself the conqueror of the ocean. He also demanded that a triumphal arch be built in his honor, and he had statues erected of himself throughout the city. This imaginary war and triumphal procession were seen as signs of Caligula's increasing megalomania and delusions. Two years later, he'd be assassinated. He'd alienated and ticked off so many people by that point that it seemed inevitable. Now it's unclear whether or not his horse was involved. Ponzi Scheme While Charles Ponzi didn't invent the Ponzi Scheme, the fact that it's named after him is pretty telling. His robbing Peter to pay Paul scam netted him millions of dollars. Some reports say that at one point he was raking in $250,000 a day, but nothing lasts forever, and Ponzi scheme very quickly blew up in his face. Oh, yeah, and also he was involved in trafficking people. Born in 1882 in Italy, Ponzi immigrated to the U.S. in 1903 and immediately was up to no good. He made his way up to Canada, where he was arrested and convicted for his involvement in a check forgery scheme in Montreal. Ponzi did three years in St. Vincent de Paul Penitentiary in Montreal from 1908 to 1911. When he was released in 1911, Ponzi was not rehabilitated. He got involved in another criminal endeavor, a scheme to smuggle Italian immigrants into the United States. At the time, there were strict immigration laws, and people were trying different things to circumvent them. Ponzi was reportedly part of a group involved in smuggling Italian immigrants across the border. But you know, his stint as a smuggler was short-lived. Ponzi was arrested by authorities and subsequently convicted. He served about two years at Atlanta Federal Penitentiary from 1911 to 1913 for his role in the immigration smuggling operation. And when he got out, he moved to Boston, where he worked as a nurse at a mining camp and held some other odd jobs. Then he struck mental gold. Gold for him, at least. In the early 1920s, Ponzi claimed that he could take advantage of the price difference in international reply coupons, which were used for buying postage stamps. He promised investors super high returns of 50% within 45 days or 100% within 90 days. He eventually convinced thousands of people to invest their money with him, promising substantial profits. Think of it this way. There are special coupons that you can buy for a low price in one country and then exchange them for a higher value in another country. It's like buying a $1 coupon in one place and being able to exchange it for a $2 coupon in another place. Hey, that sounds pretty good. Now, a guy with a nice suit comes along and says, Buongiorno, if you give me all of your money, and I can invest in these coupons. Get them more money for them, and then you'll make a fantastic fortune. But obviously, the foundation of Ponzi scheme was built on deceit. He used the money from new investors to pay off early investors, creating an illusion of successful returns. Ponzi scheme relied entirely on the continuous influx of new investors to sustain itself. As long as more people invested, he could maintain the appearance of profitability. 
The scheme unraveled when investigative journalists started questioning the legitimacy of Ponzi's operations. In 1920, the Boston Post published an expose highlighting the unsustainable nature of his investment model. Now, because of that, panicked investors started demanding their money back, and Ponzi's fraudulent activities were revealed. Ponzi was arrested that same year and his notorious scheme collapsed, leaving a whole lot of investors financially devastated and seething mad. It's estimated that his investors lost a total of $20 million, around $207 million in today's money. Six banks actually completely folded because of it. He was charged with 86 counts of mail fraud and faced life in prison. But white-collar criminals often get off pretty easy. The judge, Clarence Hale, gave a nice little speech before sentencing Ponzi, where he said it will not do to have the world understand that such a scheme as that can be carried out without receiving substantial punishment. But let's not go too crazy. It's not like he had a small amount of illicit substances on him or anything. Five years. Ponzi ended up serving three and a half. He then got hit with more state charges in Massachusetts, 10 counts of larceny to be exact, and was found guilty and got seven to nine more years. He got out on bail though in 1925 while still appealing his case and then immediately started a scam selling swampland in Florida. Yeah, alligators anyone? It was like selling apples to an apple farmer. He was caught trying that too. He was sent back to Massachusetts where he served seven more years in prison. Then he went back to Italy, tried his best to scheme some more, but he wasn't very successful. He lived out the last years of his life in Brazil, poor and in poor health. What other dumb people in history do you know about? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.